This is another episode of Taste of Messiah, or I like to say Taste of Mashiach, because indeed Jesus the Messiah is Yeshua HaMashiach, the, the Jewish, the Hebrew Messiah. That's who we're waiting for. We need to understand that first and foremost. And we, we, we're in this week's Torah portion that has, it has the word Bakudia, which means by my decrees. And it's Leviticus 26, 3 through 27, 34. It's not a very long Torah portion, although it is stacked full of information. It's the 42nd day of the Omar. Whoever said that was correct. It is the 42nd day. And in thinking of this, it's like resetting for a thousand years, like I said, as if that could happen, but it's not going to happen. We're in the last moments before the Lord comes. And understand, this is amazing to me. When I first heard this teaching us uh, many years ago, that in Judaism, not Christianity, in Judaism, Judaism, there is two comings are two impartations, are two manifestations of the Messiah coming to Israel. Now, interestingly enough, they never have seen yet that he's already come the first time, outside of a few thousand, which is wonderful. But we're talking about a population of over 17 million Jews in the world, maybe 20 million, somewhere in that area. And we're talking about only a few thousand, so it's a drop a minuscule drop in the bucket of how many Jews actually believe in the Messiah. So his first coming would be known as Mashiach, I want you all to say it with me, Mashiach ben Joseph, which means Messiah ben Joseph, son of Joseph. And if you remember the story of Joseph, and it's an amazing story because it, it shows so many uh, similarities of of what Jesus would do when he came the first time. His suffering servant. He was the suffering servant. And they understood, they understand that there is supposed to be this suffering servant. And he's already came. That's the point. So we're getting ready, which we'll get to the end of the message. The the um, uh, Yeshua, our Messiah, Mashiach, Ben David the reigning king. And you know, David is represented by the lion of Judah. So when he comes back, he's not coming as he came in the first term, which was a baby in a manger where they, he was out there. Nobody even really knew where he was except for a few people. And he kind of grew up in this solitude and quiet. And even as he began to become notary and, and famous, he would tell the people, don't tell people about me. And it, it couldn't stop because of his works that he did. And because, listen, he was God in the flesh. Yeah. And he's coming back as God in the flesh. And we talked about last week how that he was, we worship him as the invisible God. Our God right now to us is invisible. We see his wonders. We see what he does. We see his works. But we don't see him. But the time is coming we we will see him face to face. And that is an exciting time. So in this first term, talking about uh, the Lord, they, they mention uh, the, the decrees. And that's what the word Bakudia means, to follow his decrees. And I, I just stuck this in because <laughs> mandates. I mean, if you're like me, you hate the word mandates. Because mandates are from our government, which is chock full of evil, Right? But God's mandates, God's purposes, God's rules are perfect. And so, and you know, it's sadly because so much of Christianity separates from the truth, uh, the truth, but also the truth being the law. They separate from the law. And so here's the thing. If you separate the law, you just separated God. You right. just dissolved him. Like a fizzy. You ever, anybody remember fizzies? I don't know where yeah. that came from. It just came out of nowhere. Uh, but you know, it's little packages like Alka-Seltzer. You drop them in water and they make these horrible tasting grape drinks. Yeah. 
Because I don't know how I, it's like almost like your parents were trying to poison you or something. Because these things were terrible, but kids would love them. Oh, it's just so great. Because the only thing we ever got to drink was water. Pretty much, I got to drink was water. So you got something in anything. Anyway, if we dissolve God by taking away, you know, we're supposed to to be like Him. That's the purpose of the laws. Is so that we not that we can measure up to Him? Because let me ask you. Okay, here's the point. I've thought about this a lot the last couple of days. So let's just suppose that you go and you go into a store and you shoplift. And you do this for quite a few years. What might you be known as? A thief or a shoplifter, right? Okay, but now let's just say, let's see, today I think about everything I do, I'm going to think about I'm going to do it right. I'm going to do do it right. I'm going to do everything right. Do you know what I mean? I'm going to be nice to everybody. I'm going to answer everybody in the right way. I'm going to, everything I do, I'm going to think about it. And I'm going to do it right. So what I might be known as? Righteous? No. There's only one way you can be righteous. And that's the blood of Jesus. That's, right. Amen. that's the only thing that makes you righteous. But here's the thing. Once you are made righteous, then you need to walk in righteousness. Amen. You don't become saved and then just become... I've heard people... Why we talking about it last night? You just become free. I just can do whatever I want. I'm free. I'm saved now. I've got that taken... I've heard even people say, well, I've got that taken care of. I'm saved and i got that taken care of. Wow. I still tremble sometimes in fear. I, and, and God still brings up to my mind those verses where he says um, in Matthew and other places too, where he says, you know, didn't we preach in your name? Look at me. I'm standing here preaching. Th this really makes me think. And, and did we cast out demons? I've never done that that I know of, maybe, but not, I didn't really see any real you know, evidence of it. So I can't really say that I have or not. Or raise people from the dead? Didn't we do all these things in your name? And he says, depart from me. I never knew you. Look, if that's in the Bible, that should cause, that should cause, it should cause, and it's not cold in here to me. I, it just causes me to shiver. To think about the person that I love more than anybody else, that I would somehow one day be told to leave. I didn't know you. How horrible would that be? So it behooves us to obey him. Because he goes on, that verse, I, I got to finish the verse because he says, you who work iniquity. And you know what iniquity translates to? Lawlessness. Nothing about the... And what is the law? The law is the Torah. So we need the Torah. You know, it's so it's so shocking that that the church has said we're not under the law. What? We're not under the law of sin and death. They've taken one part of the law and applied it to all of the law. You understand? The one part that says because of we're saved, we're saved. We're not under the law of sin and death. In other words, we will not be eternally damned. Right, George? Because we've been saved by the blood of the Lamb. So we are not under that law of sin and death. You understand? It's not the whole Torah. We are most certain. Because, because here's, what, here's what you can... When I say this, you go, well, yeah, that makes sense. So if we're saved, then can we go and kill? No. Then can we go and commit adultery? No. Then can we do? Can we go and steal? No. Then can we go and become drug fiends or drunkards? No. What does Revelation twenty one eight say? But the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the whoremongers, the sorcerers, and all liars shall have their part in the lake with burns with forever with fire and brimstone. Is that what it says? Amen. That's what the Bible says. So, look, I was a liar, but now I'm not a liar anymore. Does that mean I never lie anymore? Well, maybe I sometimes do. Maybe even to myself. Maybe, you know, not, it's not necessarily a lie you tell us out hourly, but maybe sometimes you lie to yourself. That, well, I'm going to do such and such a thing, or I think this way, and you really don't think this way. You're deceiving yourself. That's a lie. 
but I don't practice it. You understand? There's a difference between stripping and following and being in this sinful flesh and, and living in, in, in the lie, in living in lawlessness. So we don't want to live in lawlessness. Amen? Amen. And here's what the Lord says. He says, and, and this, is his, this is before His first coming, but it, it, it kind of uh, sets the stage, these mandates, set the stage before Jesus comes. So He says, if you walk in this, my statues and keep my commandments, and, and just picture, it's the Lord God that said this, but picture Jesus saying this, because He could have just as easily, and He would have said these very same things. And you keep my commandments and perform them, then I will give you rain in its season, and the land that you yield will, will yield its fruit, and the trees of the field shall uh, yield their fruit, and I will give peace in the land, and you shall lie down, and none of you shall be afraid. I will rid the land of evil beasts, and the sword will not go through your land. <laughs> Stop right there. Why do you think we're seeing this, all this evil and all these even children being killed? Because God's protection is not on our land. Right. It's a horrible thing to think about. But it's exactly what's going on. You will chase your enemies and they will fall by the sword before you. Five of you shall put chase a hundred and a hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight. Your enemies shall fall by the sword before you. Now that's what I want to be, don't you? I want to obey God's laws and even when hell's going on all around me that God's going to honor His Word for me. Amen. And my house. Amen. And I will be able to stand with my brothers and say, you get out of here. We stand with the Lord. You're not going to do this to us. Amen. We love God. And we follow God. This is where we have to be. This is It's coming down to where it's getting real. You know? But now this, then he says, but... He makes the he flips the coin. He says, "But if you do not obey me and you do not observe all these commandments, I will also do this to you. I will even appoint terror over you, wasting disease and fever, which shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart. And you shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it." Do you know we have a problem with food? Even the babies we have a serious, serious problem. God, it's, it's actually in the Bible where Matthew says, woe to the women who, who nurse feed, who breastfeed in those days. Yeah, that's right. This is the end. I will set my face against you and you shall be defeated by your enemies. Those who hate you shall reign over you and you shall flee when no one pursues you. This is to the nation that would act this way. This is to Israel. Now this is to us. So Yeshua, now, He knew all these things were going to happen. He's not fooled by everything that's going on in our country right now. He knew before, when we were first becoming a nation, when the pilgrims came here with the, with the reformers who didn't want to go under the rules, the mandates of the Church of England, and they come here and they wanted to be free and worship God freely and keep His... And do you realize that the first pilgrims, they kept His moed? They kept his moed. They didn't. They didn't right. follow all these these uh, this 300 A.D. sect that was was given to us by uh, Constantine and then the church fathers. And before you point the, the fingers at Constantine, just understand that the whole church is involved in this. Yeah. The whole church is in this, and it's got to stop. It really has to stop. It has to come to an end. So. Jesus, but he's, he knew it was going to happen, and he's bringing it to light right now. He's bringing the restoration that he promised. So he says, from that time, Yeshua began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things. He goes on, he says, so, so look what he says. He says, I've got to go to Jerusalem. I've got to be crucified, buried, and raised from the dead. That's what he said. Now, he's told him this before in other places. And it's like, whoo, right over their head. They didn't even see it. I mean, you would think that somebody tells you that I'm going to be crucified, that you would hear what they just said. But they didn't hear him. This time Peter hears him. And look what happens. So then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, that this shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense for me, uh, to me, and you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. Now you think, why would he say that to Peter? Because Peter sounds like he's concerned that Jesus is going to go to the cross 
And he doesn't want this to happen because he cares about him. He doesn't want him to die, right? But see, this is why I think, and this is no proof, and I'm, I'm not saying this is doctrine or anything like that, but I really, it, it makes me sometimes think this is, this is something, another way to look at something we, we don't usually look at this way. And this is this, that we think that when, you know, you can see t-shirts, and it, and it could be true, that you see Jesus on the cross, and he's dying. And Satan thinks he's won. You, you, you understand? He thinks, oh, I've got him killed. He's, he's, he's done. But you have to understand. You've got to understand. Satan knows who this is. That's right. He knows this is God. And so, what I think, when Peter says, no, you can't go, because see, Satan didn't want him to go to the cross. This is how I see it. I'm not saying I'm right. Because you see, if Jesus didn't go to the cross and didn't pay for your sins and wasn't killed and wasn't buried and wasn't resurrected, you aren't saved. You understand? So I think Satan knew the plan. I really do think this. Because actually it goes all the way back to Abraham and Isaac when he gave him a picture. <coughs> when the, when I, God was going to, excuse me, Abraham was going to offer Isaac on the on the on the offering, right? And it was totally a picture of God the Father offering His Son, and yet the resurrection. And so, Satan didn't want that to happen. Now, I could be wrong about this. I'm, I'm just telling you, it's just another interesting way to think about it. Um, okay, so now, so we go on. So get behind me, for you an offense to me. For you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. I can imagine this was like a kick in the stomach, couldn't you? I mean, he's showing concern to the Lord and the next thing you know, because he didn't know he was being duped, that actually Satan was speaking through him. Because he was. Because, look, Jesus isn't going to say to you, get behind me, Satan, if Satan's not speaking through you. He's not going to call you Satan, because you are not Satan. And you're not a demon. But demons operate through us. Amen? That's right. You know, that's what we shouldn't really hate any any person. We should hate the enemy that's 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 using them. Even poor Joe Joe Biden. A, as much as I'd like to just punch him right in the nose, you know, that goofy old man. But the, the same the, the sad part is the horrors of what will happen to this man if he doesn't turn and repent. You understand? Right. The same with Obama, the same with so many others. Uh, it, it is so tragic. You know that, that 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 they're where they are, but they're definitely being used by the enemy in huge ways, and that's the part we need to hate—not the person, but the sin. Just like when we talk about when we speak about the sin of homo homosexuality, we don't hate homosexuals. God forbid. Think about if they don't repent of their sin. What's going to be their end? Do you do you really want to think about anybody being cast away from God forever? I don't. I don't hate anybody that much. I don't hate anybody, as a matter of fact, let alone that much. So he goes on, he says, For who, whosoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is of a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? So in other words, don't be afraid about your life. Do not be afraid. I mean, yes, you're supposed to take care of your life. You should you should take care of your body. It's God's gift to you. But don't try to preserve it because it's going to die. Don't try to keep you know keep living when God is wanting you to, to honor and glorify Him with your death because He will do that to some people. For the Son of Man will come in the glory of His Father with His angels and then He will reward each one according to His works. Now this is amazing. This could be puzzling. He said, Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste of death until they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. Now, does that seem kind of confusing? Yeah. Jesus was going to die. He was going to resurrect, go back to heaven. And yet some of His disciples weren't going to die until they saw His glory. Well, look what happens. And this is... This is something, this is very amazing here. This, going back to Judaism, speaking of Judaism, this passage of Scripture here is read every year 
for the feast of Shavuot. And now look what it says. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all those who, those who do wickedly, will be stubble. And the day will be which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. But to you who fear my name, the sun, uh, interesting how, you see how it says the sun is capitalized? Yeah. It's a play on words that God is doing here. It's actually capitalized in your Bible. The sun is not a capital place, but a capital. It's it's prophetically speaking of the Son of God right. is righteous. Not the sun in the sky, but the Son of Righteousness shall, shall arise with healing in His wings. And you shall go out and, and grow fat like steel, excuse me, stall-fed calves. And every time I read this, I think about these little calves around my house and, and they'll, they'll run and they'll kick and they'll pop up their legs and they'll run and chase after other cows. You know, in a few more months, they, you can't hardly get them to move. They just stand there. But they're just so funny and so cute and when they're just little and they just go and rip and run and, and kick up their heels. And that's the joy we're going to have when He comes. He says, You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. On the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts, this is the day we're waiting for. Yeah. He says, Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all of Israel with the statutes and judgments, which we just talked about, the statutes and judgments. So there's a whole bunch more, but in, in, in a small way, we understand that his laws and judgments are important for us. He says, Behold, now this is huge right here. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. So this prophet, this spirit of Elijah came in the spirit of John the Baptist. Right. And he announced the first coming of the Messiah, Yeshua. Amen? Yeah. So that was, that was the, the announcement of the first coming of the Lord, of the Messiah, who was Yeshua ben Yosef.